Welcome to episode 315 of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. I'm a retired agent on a mission to show you who the FBI is and what the FBI does through my books, my blog, and my podcast case reviews with former colleagues. Today, we get to speak to retired agents, Chris Englund, who served in the FBI for over 24 years, and Craig McLaughlin, who served in the FBI for 23 years. In this episode, they review Operation Crown Prince, an investigation into Afghan nationals residing in the U.S., transporting heroin into the country and providing proceeds to the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, and insurgents as a means of material support for their operations combating U.S. and allied forces. The case was nicknamed the Great Chicken Caper as it originated with intelligence that proceeds were laundered through Afghan-owned fried chicken businesses along the East Coast. At the time, FBI officials characterized the investigation as one of the most important being run out of the New York office and represented the friction between those fighting the war on terrorism and those fighting the war on drugs. The case resulted in several large kilogram seizures of heroin originating from Afghanistan, dozens of arrests, multiple disruptions and dismantlements, and ultimately the conviction of the world's largest opium producer, Bazir Norzai, a prominent Afghan tribal leader. In September 2022, authorities released Norzai, who had been sentenced to life in prison, in exchange for U.S. contractor Mark Farrick, who was being held hostage by the Taliban. Retired agent Chris Anglin's first assignment was to the New York field office, where he worked on a violent crime squad until he volunteered for reassignment to the International Terrorism Task Force prior to the attacks of 9-11. Shortly after, Chris reported to Guantanamo Bay, Gitmo, in Cuba, where he assisted in determining the process and course of interrogations of detainees. Later, he accepted a transfer to the FBI's office in Springfield, Illinois, and was first assigned to a Joint Terrorism Task Force and then formed a Safe Streets Task Force in eastern Illinois before stepping into the role of Strategic Partnership Coordinator. Prior to retiring, Chris joined the National Academy Unit at Quantico, Virginia. Currently, he is employed as Associate Director, Federal Public Safety for Verizon Business Development. Retired agent Craig McLaughlin worked primarily on national security matters, including counterintelligence and counterterrorism. He served in the New York office for 14 years and was a member of the New York office JTTF and Evidence Response Team. Craig served as the lead counterterrorism assistant legal attache at the U.S. Embassy in Berlin, Germany for four years before finishing his FBI career as a supervisor leading a counterintelligence squad in Newark, New Jersey. Currently, Craig works in global corporate security at Verizon. Now, before we get to the case review, I have to remind you one more time that on Sunday, April the 28th, 2024, I am hosting FBI Retired Case File Review live at the Punchline Comedy Club in Philadelphia. The podcast meetup event is free and doors open at 1130 and the program runs to 2 p.m. I can't wait to see you. I'm bringing lots of podcast stickers and FBI swag to give away. In your podcast app's description of this episode, there's a link to my website where you'll find more information about the live event, including the case that we'll be reviewing and the names and episodes for the former retired agents who will be in attendance, ready to answer all your questions about their case, their career, and of course, the FBI. There's also a link to where you can join my reader team to keep up with the FBI and books, TV, and movies. Thanks for your support. Now here's the show. I want to welcome my guests, retired agent Chris Anglin and Greg McLaughlin. How are you guys doing? Doing great. Doing great. Thank you. Excellent. 
when I first heard about this case, I just knew that it was perfect for FBI retired case file review. I mean, come on, we're going to be talking about drug trafficking and terrorist financing all in one. I mean, (laughs) what more could you ask for? Now, we're going to start off this case review with Chris talking primarily. But Craig, I understand that you come into this case a little bit later. Why don't you explain your role? And then after Chris does the drug setup, then we'll have you come back on. Chris kind of obviously had the drug background and began it as a drug investigation. But given that this was an investigation that was after 9-11, the recognition that there was potential intelligence and connections to Afghanistan and to the Taliban was what FBI management really wanted us to make sure that we weren't missing, even though we were doing a criminal investigation. That's kind of the role that I was brought in on, looking at the international, the overseas piece with the Taliban and things in order to make sure that we captured all the intelligence and then we reported all the intelligence out to the intelligence community, even while we were doing a criminal investigation, a drug investigation. Chris, where do we want to start? Well, I guess we start at the beginning. We had a very good opportunity that really just presented itself out of nowhere, out of thin air, it seemed like. I believe it was just after 9-11 and after I had returned from Guantanamo Bay. January of 2022 is when I started down in Gitmo and I got back end of March. And shortly thereafter, we had one of those walk-in sources to the front office in New York City, which usually turn out to be nothing. And this one just happened to develop into something that was more extraordinary than not. So I was sitting at my desk one morning and got a phone call from the op center. They said, hey, Chris, we've got an individual here that says he has an opportunity to buy drugs from an Iranian. And we didn't usually hear a lot of that over on the terrorism squad. That usually went to a drug squad, but they decided that it should be filtered our way. So I sat down with this individual, spent several hours with him, and he basically convinced me that he was able to do what he said he could do. So we're sitting in an interview room on a late morning, then turned into an early afternoon. He sends me a picture of the subject's driver's license, which I thought was ironic because you don't usually see that, especially on a first meeting. Tells me of a story where he's sitting in a bar with the subject and this person offered up 100 kilos of heroin to him. I did a little bit of background check. I sent out the name and driver's license information and found out this person was not from Iran, but he was from Afghanistan. He actually had a previous drug history. So we started to put some of the pieces of puzzle together and the credibility started to build with the source. I made a couple of phone calls because a source said he'd worked with agents in the past and got a hold of those agents. And it was kind of a funny scenario because the two individuals that I spoke with that had worked with this source said, well, you know, it might be a bumpy ride, but it's going to be a roller coaster worth your time and effort. Sure enough, that's what happened. So he started taking us through this conversation that he'd had and the rapport that he'd developed with the subject. The subject ended up meeting him again very shortly after that confirmed that he had 15 kilos of heroin available at that particular point from his source. We had a great opportunity to introduce a fantastic uh, historical figure in the FBI, and that was Jack Garcia. Sorry, my dog's in the background. No problem. Yeah, that's Hoover, actually, my Labradoodle. Not the vacuum cleaner, the director. I like that. So we're back to uh, Jack Garcia agrees to join our clan of misfit toys and start to plan a weekend of fun activities that started off at a steakhouse, meeting the subject, introduction that was arranged by our source with the subject and with our undercover. Went extremely well. My partner, John Dugan, at the time, he and I were able to cover the meeting from the inside. We had a surveillance team on the outside. That was a Friday night. We set it up for the following day to be able to do an exchange. We had flash money. We had the perfect scenario outside of the individual's restaurant, which I'll get to the connection there here shortly. We set it up for a specific time. Jack went to the location where the subject was. The three of them walked back to the undercover's car, opened up the trunk, showed them the flash money. They walked over to the subject's car. And that's when Jack Garcia, while he was on a recording device, started counting out the kilos. And we pulled up and made the arrest, tried to do it as quickly and quietly as possible to try to gain the cooperation of the subject. Ended up putting him in handcuffs, bringing him a few blocks away from the location, and he cooperated immediately. Was very, very scared, obviously, in that situation. So that was an interesting experience from the get-go. 
trying to bring somebody down off of a very high adrenaline dump and have an actual good exchange with them, explaining that they were safe, that there was nobody there to hurt them, that this was not something that was going to cause them any kind of physical discomfort, etc. That's obviously in a narcotic situation, having worked it for several years, that's the first thing people think of when those situations develop was, am I safe? Am I going to be harmed? Is my family okay? So we reassured him at that point in time, explained who we were, what we were looking for, and he was very cooperative right out of the gate. Explained who his source was. We were able to get an emergency wiretap, Title Three. went up on that phone. Long story short, and we'll get into the details from there, but we were able to identify eight different narcotics traffickers, all from Afghanistan, up and down the East Coast, resulting in arrest and conviction of all eight of those individuals. The subject that we initially registered was Abdul Azratzada. He was a younger Afghan. He owned a fried chicken restaurant that was underneath the Queensboro Bridge, had that restaurant for several years, but it was one of many. We identified numerous locations that had various names, Crown Fried Chicken, Prince Fried Chicken, New York Fried Chicken, Kennedy Fried Chicken. They were all Afghan owned. They were all using those locations as not just an income generator for themselves and their family, but also for a location that we believed and still believe to this day were used for money laundering purposes from the proceeds from the sale of heroin or other illicit activities. We know they were using hawalas, hawaladars, to move cash back and forth between the U.S. and Afghanistan and other locations throughout the world because we could not identify banking accounts at the time, but knew that there were large amounts of money being trafficked. We identified several methods of trafficking of the heroin, of the opium. There was sporting goods equipment that was used. They were using garments where they would sew piping into the lining of the garments that inside the piping was the heroin. They could get almost a kilo of heroin in each garment. They were using post office boxes, FedEx, you name it. They were using a number of different avenues to make sure that they would fly under the radar and had been doing so for quite some time. Let me make two comments. First of all, we got to stop and talk a little bit about Jack Garcia, because I worked with him in Philly while he was there for a short time and got to know him really well. And I interviewed him on this podcast, episode 225. As a matter of fact, I just texted him and he said, laugh out loud that you're a great guy. But the funny thing is that I've done a number of episodes with different agents about different violations, and he always seems to pop up in some way. I was not expecting him to pop up in this particular case, but definitely nice to hear his name because he is a living legend. Yeah, he fit the bill perfectly. I mean, he was able to step in as an established organized crime figure that this group would not have any clue about, which was helpful on many levels, as you well know. There's just an easy way to insert somebody of Jack's character and stature into this group that has never really interacted with Italians, Cubans, whatever you want to label Jack as, which he happily takes both. He's just a force to be reckoned with in the undercover world and has just a long history of success. When I was looking for an undercover quickly, his name popped up immediately and we had no problem placing him in this situation. Here are my two questions about what we've talked about so far. Why did this informant come to the FBI with this information? And if he was going to do that, why didn't he go back to the guys that he had originally worked with? Guys that he had originally worked with had been reassigned to different squads. He knew that going straight to the op center was an avenue that he could take. He had been removed from the country on a couple of occasions and had returned somewhat recently from his removal from the country for criminal activity that he had conducted or been involved in after he had been working with the FBI. This person was of a character that he continuously found ways to get into trouble. So he had stolen a lot of merchandise. He had stolen some precious jewels on occasion. And he had been here illegally from Europe. It was an easy removal process or a decision to remove him on the occasions that he had. And he always found a way to get back here. And he really wanted to find a reason to stay. So we went through the SPBP program to keep him for this case. And that was successful. You dropped an acronym, and for the listeners, 
Oh, yeah. Significant Public Benefit Parole is SPBP. And that was a program where we worked with the Immigration Customs Enforcement to bring people into the country legally after they had been ejected from the country and had reentered illegally. So we had to go to the border and he had to walk across the border and come back in. So to demonstrate that he actually entered this country under legal premises instead of the illegal component. I think that program has sunsetted to some extent, and there are other ways to do this, but there were a lot of resources that we had to expend in order for that to be accomplished. And it was obviously worthwhile because it ended up being a very good case overall for the long run. Was that his motivation to find a way to be able to legally stay here? Because we all know that unless it's authorized, FBI sources are not allowed to commit crimes. Right. We had to get to that SBBP process. He wanted to stay in the country. This was an avenue for him to do it. He also needed money. So we were able to provide a small amount for his effort, his work on this case. And he was also motivated by the excitement of it. He was an adrenaline junkie. He wanted to be with the FBI making these things happen. He'd done it in the past. He'd had a taste of the success of working with agents. Agents, as you know, Jerry, are usually personable people. So the friendship, I think, in his mind was a big part of it. And he felt that every time he met an agent, he became friends with them and best friends with them, if he would be left to describe it, I'm sure. So those are all of his motivations. And, you know, it was reinforced throughout. And his success was almost inevitable because he had that character trait that really allowed people to open up to him early and often. We ended up making another case with him shortly thereafter that was a fantastic case as well, probably for another podcast. He was a very successful informant, and we were very happy to utilize his services to identify some very bad people. And so my next question has to do with Abdul Azrazada, and that was, why did he feel he needed to involve organized crime into what seems like was already a very successful drug trafficking enterprise. So what we found with Abdul was that he wasn't necessarily the person who was benefiting from any kind of narcotics activity on a regular basis. He was looking for the opportunity to make a quick and large amount of money to subsidize his business that was barely getting by with a family that was living very modestly, to say the least. And he was directly connected to Mohammedina Zizi, who was the supplier, who was also living very modestly, but making a considerable amount of money. He lived modestly to fly under the radar and not be detected by law enforcement. So it was a strategy for him, whereas Azrat Zada was, it was a necessity to make some money in a very short period of time. Azrat Zada had been convicted on a possession and distribution charge of cocaine many, many years ago, had spent some time in prison believe that he had been out of the business for a little while and had recently gotten back into it because of the proceeds that he could earn in that capacity that I just described. So drug trafficking was more prosperous than fried chicken wings. Yes. Despite the attempts to make those businesses profitable, they were sustainable, but not necessarily significantly profitable. Now, I understand that you had a nickname for this case. The Great Chicken Caper. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I think I I read that in one of the articles. Yep. So the Great Chicken Caper, uh, a.k.a. Operation Crown Prince, I got a lot of slack about from the front office for naming it Operation Crown Prince. And it became Major Case 190, which I believe that the 9-11 attacks was Major Case 189. Now, obviously, Prince Fried Chickens, it was a nice little play on words, but headquarters had a little bit of an issue with it because the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia and the connection to Saudi Arabia, and we didn't have an actual investigation of Saudi Arabia. We didn't want to give the wrong impression that we were investigating Saudis instead of the actual subjects of this case. So there was some consternation at first after a long explanation to headquarters and a little bit of a back and forth. They went ahead and approved it. Excellent. Now that I'm all caught up, why don't you continue with where you left off? We took this drug investigation knowing that the proceeds were heading back to the Taliban in some capacity. And of course, the Taliban had been the sponsors of Al-Qaeda within their borders 
There were 23 training camps that al-Qaeda had located within the borders of Afghanistan and were called the guests by the leadership of the Taliban, Mullah Muhammad Omar, being the leader of the Taliban at the time. We had all of these components, these tentacles that were reaching into what had become a very large terrorism investigation, although the Taliban had never been really designated a terrorist group. We had certainly shown that the financing of that terrorism group, the largest of the terrorism groups, was a substantial reason to be involved in these investigations. We ended up having 18 different domestic divisions of the FBI involved in this case. We had a number of different seizures up and down the East Coast. I believe there was a 40 kilo seizure in a Baltimore warehouse at one point in time. We were all the way out to San Francisco where a couple of kilos and subjects were caught and seized. And then we had These restaurants identified as locations where money was being funneled through from Washington, D.C. all the way up to Boston. So it was a substantial and large investigation that we had at one point in time over 200 agents involved. And we did case coordination meetings that we had one in Denver where everybody came to coordinate and make sure that we were complementing each other instead of competing against each other. We had connections to some of the hijackers with the financing components that were two, three times removed at points, but we could show that there was enough intel there that we could connect things to actual terrorism activities. And that was what was driving this train the entire time, was this desire to shut down these funding sources, these substantial funding sources. Of course, Afghanistan is still well known as the majority of opium is grown within those borders. And the heroin resulting from that is shipped all over the world. There was a component of this where we were getting pushback from the Drug Enforcement Agency where they had shown in many multiple reports that most of the heroin that was coming into the U.S. was coming from across the Mexican border and was grown in South America and Mexico. And they didn't believe there was a substantial amount that was coming from Europe or Afghanistan. And I think we proved that wrong very quickly. But that was some consternation between agencies a little bit there. But we ended up working together with them, as the articles you've read dictate. This sounds like there's so many components involved. Usually, as you work on a large FBI undercover operation like this, There are goals that you have that are set forth that you'll need to prove in order to prove the conspiracy. So I'm just really curious about all of the people, agent and non-agent, that are working on this case with you. So we had a number of different headquarters units, especially that were very valuable, including TFOS, the Terrorism Financing Operations Section that was stood up after 9-11, expanded considerably. They were a big component of this because of the intricate nature of the exchange of funds that were received from these activities. It was imperative that we had experts on this that could track the money. There was a way to track it. They were going to be the ones to find it. So we really involved them early on and often. One of my former classmates was down there, had been there for a little while, and he was able to kind of facilitate this from his standpoint, which again points out that relationships in the FBI are really the most important thing by far. It's not always what you know, but who you know. Those connections are what really made this case push forward. During the criminal investigation of these subjects, I was able to put together an intelligence product that was close to 70 pages long. We identified all of the major landowners that were facilitating the growth of opium on their properties. When I say properties, they were basically provinces the size of small states in the U.S. that were farmland that had been turned from growing pomegranates and pistachios and a number of other legitimate agricultural products into what was left to be grown, which were basically weeds that had nice flowers on them, but it turned into an illicit substance. And that's the long history of Afghanistan. They call it the graveyard of empires because every major empire throughout history have gone in there to try to capture it, have rejected. And that includes the Russians from 79 to 89. But the devastation that was caused in each of these attempts to occupy that country have resulted in a very low standard of living. And that turned into opium being a very quick cash crop and easily grown despite the destruction of their irrigation systems. They were able to use what was available to them in order to support their families. Not to give them any out on this, but that's really the history of how this occurred. 
So there's some reluctance involved in this based upon religious components of being able to do harm to others. Those are all interesting conversations that Craig and I have had with a number of the individuals that we have come across in the past. But that intelligence product identified Haji Bashir Norzai as probably the largest of the landowners and the producers of opium that eventually became heroin and was transported here. And that really sparked just another tentacle of this, which was really the major part for a lot of the agencies. And of course, our agency, the DEA, the U.S. Attorney's Office, they were really the ones that, the U.S. Attorney's Office was really the ones that facilitated lure of Haji Norzai to the United States. And that's really where this whole case kind of culminated into. This is really so fascinating because you are working still a regular drug trafficking investigation. And so you have Abdul. And I take it there were others that were involved in just the drug trafficking. And then you go into this international drug trafficking conspiracy. I really, I'm just trying to get my brain around all of these different components. You weren't the only one trying to wrap their head around this. Kenny Maxwell was our ASAC at time of terrorism. When I brought this case to him, beginning before Jack Garcia is even introduced to the picture Kenny's like, I'll give you a couple of weeks, but this is a drug case and we don't need to be working drug cases on the terrorism side. So he pushed back pretty hard on this. And of course, the weekend comes through and we end up seizing the heroin and I'm bringing it to the office and I have it in a big box that we just come back from the car. And I went into his office and put the box down in front of him. I said, how's that for enough evidence to keep this thing moving along? And he kind of chuckled and he says, yeah, you got it. Let's see where it leads us. And he really let us go from there. It was one of the largest heroin seizures we'd had in the New York office for several years. And in fact, another great story that came out of this, the drug squad that I was originally assigned to, C-11, which had a number of very senior agents and 20-plus year detectives from the NYPD, all of fantastic, wonderful case agents and case detectives that I was privileged to work with at the inception of my career, had a couple of them take me under their wing. We had a couple of new agents on the squad that would all agree that it was one of the best places to land right out of Quantico. So Tom McNally had been really the senior leader on that squad when I arrived, and I had left that squad in July of 2001. Do the math, and the timing was inevitable for this type of investigation. If it was going to happen, it was going to happen, and it did. And I, relatively new agent, walking into a terrorism squad for the first time, being assigned a a Taliban case, which was not something I was very familiar with. So I am an avid reader. I picked up as many books as I could and read voraciously until I was familiar with the location, group, the history, as much as I possibly could be before 9-11. That comes back. So the weekend of the seizure, I am processing the evidence. I'm processing the drugs. I'm putting it into uh, the different bags and filling out all the forms and we're getting ready to send it to the DEA lab for confirmation, testing. And Tom walks into the office, stands over me and he's just a towering figure, presence more than size, but he's a big man too. And he says to me, well, good job, kid. Now you did it. And not in a nice way. And I said, what are you talking about, Tom? He goes, well, you blew it. Now, where do you go? You seized all this heroin. There's only one place to go but down. And he starts laughing and he walks out the door. And that was the last probably exchange I had with him for a couple of years, believe it or not. Because he ended up going out to Long Island uh, and we just didn't have a chance to talk much since then. What a great guy he was. An amazing mentor. That's the whole thing about having a great case. You know that you're going to have your challenges. We're at a point where we have worked the drug investigation to the point where now we're back to working as an intel investigation, gone through the various stages of the domestic connections within. We are trying to find the international connections. The document, that intelligence document that I had drafted that was close to 70 pages, I had shared with the Drug Enforcement Agency. That was actually one of the catalysts for bringing the Drug Enforcement Agency into the intelligence community and the exchange of intelligence after 9-11. We were able to identify two agents from the New York office that were going to be assigned to the JTTF. They were going to contribute in the capacity that they could with their expertise and their overseas drug enforcement, the DEA offices overseas. We worked with them for a little while, and then there was a little bit of a hiatus. And then I get called to my ASAC's office at the time was now Joe Demarest. He calls me up and says, I need you to come up to my office. And I said, no problem, Joe. When he says jump, you say how high. 
I immediately went to his office, walked in the door, and he says, we have a situation here. I said, please expand. And he said, well, right now there's a very important figure that is getting onto a plane and is going to be here in New York in a very short period of time. And that person is Haji Bashir Norzai. And I sat a little stunned and I said, please explain. He said, well, the head of the DEA office here in New York has called me up and said that they have lured Haji Norzai to the U.S. under the auspices of cooperation with the United States to try to assist in any way that he can in this investigation of Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. And his information that he has is ours if we want it. And so I said, okay, what's my budget? He looked at me, he said, unlimited. I walked down to Embassy Suites in Battery Park, and I talked with the manager of the hotel there, asked how many rooms I could have on the top floor to keep as many people away from us as possible, and he was very accommodating. We were able to set up shop while Norzai was on the plane, and Craig and I had become acquainted through, I think, what, the third or fourth complete reorganization of the Joint Terrorism Task Force. We finally got to the point where the two of us were working together on the Taliban investigation, on the same squad. I had met Craig years before when he was working intelligence on the counterintelligence squads. This was just a wonderful marriage of resources. My background working drugs and having worked at Taliban during 9-11 and his intelligence capacity, Craig is a steel trap when it comes to his capacity for recall and information. So I was thrilled to have him on board. He just had to put up with me for a little while, which he didn't get any more pay for, which I'm still lobbying to try to get him because that is absolutely a task that nobody should be subjected to at any point. That's where we were. We were furiously planning the arrival of Norzai and I was getting laptops and cell phones and I had the tech guys running everything they possibly could to accommodate this intelligence case at this time. This is probably a great point to let Craig take over because his history with Norzai prior to all this going on really plays into this, and he tells a great story from here. Even though we were both involved and connected at the hip the entire time, his leadership really was what made this work and where we end up getting to a dozen days after the fact. Before you start, Craig, I have a question for you, and that is I just want to be clear about the connection between Norazai and this original case with Abdul and Crown Chicken. Do they know each other? Is there a connection? Are they just were two cases that involved terrorist financing and drug trafficking? Yeah, Norazai in Afghanistan, the land that he owned and the cultivation of opium and things was the ultimate source of the heroin that was being seized in the United States. So he was connected into this conspiracy as pretty much the primary provider, cultivator in terms of the land that he owned in Afghanistan. So he was the international piece of this whole investigation. As Chris said, I was brought in to do interviews of Haji Bashir Norzai. He has a complex history like everybody in Afghanistan. If you think back on the history of Afghanistan in the 70s, 1979, you had the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan different warlords at the time were called Mujahideen that were supported by the U.S. government to defeat the communists there. Many of these people, including Norzai, he was one of those original Mujahideen fighters fighting against Soviet Union back in those days. At the time, he fought in the same unit as Mullah Muhammad Omar, who later on becomes the overall leader of the Taliban movement. After that war, though, you had a vacuum of power within Afghanistan in the 90s. The seat on the United Nations in Afghanistan became empty. There was a kind of civil war going on. And you had this spiritual movement called the Taliban that kind of emerged in the late 90s in Afghanistan. So it was at this point also that Osama bin Laden comes to Afghanistan. And there's this kind of ethnic code of hospitality called Pashtun Wali, where he seats sanctuary in Afghanistan. Mullah Omar, as the leader at the time, provides him sanctuary. So before 9-11, it was widely known that Osama bin Laden, as Chris spoke about, was in Afghanistan, did have training camps, but he was there under the protection of the Taliban. This code is a centuries-old code among the ethnic group within Afghanistan, which is the primary ethnic group, the Pashtuns. And if you're familiar with like Marcus Luttrell's story, the lone survivor story, he's the Navy SEAL that's brought in under the same guise under Pashtun while he's protected. That was the situation. So in the United States, you still had representation of the Taliban, primarily in New York, 
The State Department still wanted to have access to governing officials within Afghanistan, although the Taliban was never recognized by the U.S. government or the United Nations as the formal governing body of Afghanistan. We were looking at the Taliban offices, the Taliban representatives in New York City even before 9-11, looking to understand was there any kind of support, understanding that there was a huge opium production coming out of Afghanistan, was there drug support, was there support for terrorism? So these were ongoing investigations. I also went over to Afghanistan shortly after 9-11, interacted with some of the Taliban officials there, and that's where I kind of came to know Haji Bashir Norzai. He is really kind of in terms of his history, where he's from and the part of Afghanistan is kind of the spiritual birthplace of the Taliban movement. It's Kandahar, a district there called Maiwin District. He is a large family, kind of a warlord type family, the Norzai family. His father had been a prominent leader. He eventually takes over this family. So he has access to large numbers of people, his family, his tribe. He supports Mullah Omar, who he had fought in Russian jihad with, who becomes the spiritual leader of the Taliban. He supported the Taliban movement out of Kandahar financially, logistically, with weapons and things like that. On 9-11, he's actually in Pakistan at the time. And he recognizes afterwards, in terms of the U.S. military involvement in Afghanistan, he's kind of then begins an attempt to kind of seek his way back to negotiate and become part of maybe kind of the next level of generation of the Afghan government post 9-11. So he has various interactions with U.S. military, U.S. intelligence agencies. That's kind of where I had interaction with him in the past. Then as we fast forward to what Chris was speaking about when we learned when that meeting with our ASAC that the Norzai was coming to the U.S., the mandate was for us as the FBI was to gather as much intelligence that could help in terms of the war on terrorism, help military. Obviously, at that point in time, we had U.S. military forces that were on the ground in Afghanistan. So we were looking really to drive as much intelligence out of these interviews, even though they were criminal interviews under a criminal investigation. That was kind of my tasking as Chris was putting together the logistics side of getting the hotel rooms and getting all the support. We set up a plan to build rapport with him as a kind of a tribal leader. He wanted to come and kind of negotiate his position within the U.S. government in terms of a future Afghan government. So we played into that to build rapport. We treated him with the hospitality and as a guest that he would have been familiar with kind of for his culture. So we asked Chris for a lot of money to spend to have a big welcoming dinner. We got some local Afghan food when he first arrived. He came with a couple other folks in his entourage and we made a big effort to welcome him as that. What my job was over the next 11 days, what I had done as soon as we found out was to interact with different intelligence agencies to let them know that we had this opportunity to speak to this individual. We were the point person within the intelligence community to funnel any questions that maybe CIA or the military or the defense intelligence agency might have had. That was kind of what I was doing. I was interacting with these intelligence agencies, developing these questions, and then primarily the interviews as a whole, as Department of Justice and DEA, we didn't really need confessions from Bashir Norzai to help the drug conspiracy. He was under a sealed indictment, which he was not made aware of. So that was always in the background. But the goal was to be able to speak to him for as long as we could and gather as much intelligence. We were using a translator. As Chris said, we were in a hotel room in the embassy suites. We would go to breakfast together, and then we would spend time doing interviews. So I would lead the interviews. The DEA was present in order to capture it under their reporting protocols. But the primary focus of these interviews was to gather intelligence that we would then share with the intelligence community. So each day we would sit down with Haji Bashir Norzai. We would give him his Miranda rights. He would waive those rights. He wanted to speak. And then primarily I was taking questions of intelligence value that the FBI knew. And I was also taking questions from other intelligence agencies, gathering the information during these interviews. And then what was the unique thing, which would becomes the new norm for the FBI, because one of the criticisms after 9-11 was that the FBI and their criminal investigations weren't sharing intelligence with the rest of the community. We made a purposeful point that each day after the interviews, I actually would write up myself what we called the time intelligence information reports. They were reports that the FBI could send out to the entire intelligence community. So we weren't waiting till the case had been concluded, the trial had been concluded. We were doing those real time. That was something we had to kind of get the U.S. Attorney's Office to be understanding of, to make sure that they were not inconsistent with what the final interview reports were from the DEA's reporting. We did that every day. And I think probably throughout the course of it, we put out probably 15 or 20 intelligence reports because we were talking about topics really not related to his drug conspiracy, but in terms of terrorism targets, 
interconnectivity, Taliban, and Al-Qaeda connections and things like that. The main goal was if he had known where Mullah Omar was at the time. He was in hiding after 9-11. He was still the leader, but had been in hiding, and there's very little intelligence. But we quickly knew that he was somebody that had a lot of connections and had a large resource ability to get connections. And he had been approached throughout his history by many different agencies to provide information. So we realized in order to get a lot of the really valuable information, we would have had to send him back to Afghanistan and then to work over there in some capacity as an intelligence asset, a criminal informant, whatever you would have. So we had those discussions internally with the DEA, with the Department of Justice, and there was just a great pressure, I think, on the Department of Justice to prosecute him for the drug aspect of this investigation, because at the time, you know, early into the war on terrorism, this is 2005, when you looked at all the narcotics kingpins, the top 10 list of the international narcotics traffickers, it was still a list full of Colombians and things like that. There was no Afghans on there. Haji Bashir Norzai, I think about the year before, probably around 2004, had been designated as a drug kingpin. So that was a, a major designation. So from a drug prosecution point of view, that was a huge kind of victory that the Department of Justice and the U.S. administration wanted to kind of apply to him. Some of us in the FBI thought there could have been greater intelligence value you know, of having him go back. But ultimately, after those 11 days of doing those Mirandize interviews, the U.S. Attorney's Office, Department of Justice, decided to execute the arrest and then try to seek his cooperation post-arrest. This is so strange. I'm sure everybody is thinking the same thing and wondering why he had no idea that what he was doing was providing incriminating evidence against himself. Yeah, I mean, part of it is the culture. If you look at who he was, his standing and his age and his time, it's just a very different culture to, to kind of understand. For him even to be alive at his age, I think he was 45, 46 at the time we were talking to him. The average age of a person in Afghanistan was like 42 years old. Like he should be dead at this point. But as a warlord, he had immense power. And he was, in terms of this Taliban spiritual movement, he was kind of the silent supporter behind the leader. Culturally, he just thought, I'm going to come to the United States and I'm going to deal with these government officials and I will negotiate my place in the future Afghan government was really what he believed to be true. So he thought he was coming here for like a State Department sit down and he didn't realize it was a drug investigation. Correct. Because of the evidence that had already been gathered through the part that the investigation that Chris had done and what the DEA had done, there wasn't this real strong need to get a confession out of him in terms of the drug aspect of it. I mean, we spoke about the opium production and how the land that he controlled and that process and how he provided that through religious obligation to the Taliban and to others. But we didn't get in depth into the actual conspiracy part of it because we already had that evidence collective view was this person was a value for the war on terrorism to understand what's going on in Afghanistan. So as the FBI is part of the intelligence community, it was our job to get as much intelligence out of him before this arrest was affected. It's still just mind boggling for me that as he talks about opium production and the heroin transporting to the U.S., that he's not realizing that he is providing incriminating information about himself. I would say that was actually a point. So I ended up being the one agent from both agencies to testify in his trial. That was an issue that the defense raised, is that we treated him as a guest, yet he wasn't free to leave, and they tried to make an issue of that. But again, as we spoke about, Justice Department had approved this lore operation, and then we used the ruse like we use in any other interview setting that we use across the FBI is to build rapport is we played into his ego, we played into his standing as a warlord, as a tribal leader, to make him think that he was coming here to negotiate this position, yet he wasn't free to go. There was always a sealed indictment that was awaiting him. You had also mentioned about the fact that at his age, it was surprising to be alive. Is that because of all the war in Afghanistan? Is that because of the different drug trafficking fights among the other drug warlords? Exactly. So after the Soviet Union is kind of expelled in the late 80s, really you have Afghanistan devolves into a civil war. It's one tribal leader after another. There's violence, there's death, there's starvation. There's not a lot of governing structure. So as the head of this tribal family, which would have been responsible for thousands of people, he was in a huge position of authority, even though he didn't have formal authority at the time. He had it at one point been the governor of Kandahar, the southern city, but he just exuded authority and he had the ability to protect himself, protect his people. He wasn't scared. There wasn't any fear in him. 
through the culture that we understood from the tribes that he was from, everything was about a negotiation. So as long as he understood this was a negotiation, he felt comfortable in coming and making his case and negotiating with the U.S. government for this position. Jerry, I don't know if you want to get into it too much, but as Craig can describe as well, when the Russians departed, we stepped in and helped create a separated government, essentially. I mean, there were seven leaders in Afghanistan after the Russians left by design, and it was acquiescing to warlords, not drug lords, but warlords that in their own respective areas were the leaders, the de facto leaders of the population of that particular corner of Afghanistan, wherever it happened to be. And then the civil war that Craig was describing was what dissolved and ended up creating this catastrophe within the country after the catastrophe that the Russians had created in and of itself, which provided the red carpet for the Taliban to come in, which was a Pakistan-based group from their intelligence service to basically take control of the country. That's why they were welcomed with open arms, because these seven leaders, these seven warlords, had conducted themselves in a way that atrocities were really the rule of the day. They were very destructive. They were very violent. They weren't leaders. They were rulers. And they were very territorial. Obviously, they wanted to conduct themselves within the framework of the places in Afghanistan that they had grown up and really taken control of. There was a lot of switching of loyalties throughout that history. Right. It was very, whatever was most efficient, whatever was most beneficial at that moment, then loyalties would be made. So at the time that we encounter Haji Bashir in Norzai in 2005, He's seen that essentially the Taliban government has fallen. Some of them have been arrested by U.S. forces. The leader is in hiding. He sees an opportunity that there's going to be a new government. He's going to look to the U.S. as that person that can help negotiate a new position for him to really continue to retain the authority, power, and control that he had already continued to have throughout the previous 30 years of his life. Well, that says a lot about the warlords when the leadership of the Taliban is preferred over them. Mm -hmm. Yes. Exactly. This is fascinating. So every day we did give Norzai his Miranda rights and he waived them. And then we would have discussions each evening with the U.S. Attorney's Office to make sure that they were comfortable with these continued Mirandais interviews. And ultimately, it was on day 11, the decision was made that we've done this enough, we've gathered enough intelligence, any future intelligence would be gained through soliciting his cooperation post-arrest. So he was arrested on day 11 of these series of interviews at the hotel by the DEA. A few weeks later, there was an initial cooperation session, proffer session. I was there. The DEA was there. He was represented at this point by his attorney. I had gone back and was working with the other intelligence agencies to say, okay, is there more intelligence that we can gather? But by the time when we got to the table in that first post-arrest interview, Norzai's position was he didn't want to cooperate at this point. He chose not to speak with us, with the U.S. government. There had been some series of incidents leading up to this post 9-11, but before he encountered us, he had interacted with the U.S. government over in Afghanistan and offered to arrange some other Taliban officials to be brought in. And then the U.S. government, Department of Defense, the forces that were there ended up arresting some of these individuals. At this point, once he's arrested, he kind of goes back to this idea that he felt like governments kind of portrayed him once again, so he didn't have any real incentive to cooperate. So he goes to trial and he's given a life sentence on the drug conspiracy charges. He wasn't charged anything related to the support of terrorism, but that was obviously kind of something in the background was we understood as a government that his cultivation and allowing his tribe and things to cultivate opium and things like that in the country led to this kind of heightened arrival of the Taliban. And then the Taliban obviously supported al-Qaeda and things. So there was kind of that indirect connection. But he was arrested. He was prosecuted on the drug charges. There was a trial. He was found guilty and he was sentenced to a life sentence at that point. That was kind of where the case ended. We weren't able to get any more intelligence because of his standing. He continued to be a figure that as the Taliban kind of waxed and waned in its authority there, you have to kind of move forward almost within the last couple of years. If you think about the U.S. withdrawal after President Biden comes into power and the U.S. officially withdraws from Afghanistan, the Taliban comes back into power. One of their key demands from that point on was the return of Haji Bashir Norzai. He was a really esteemed, valued leader within the the Taliban circles. And so myself, I think Chris, we ended up fielding multiple requests from different agents from different offices. There were certain demands coming up from the Taliban side. 
They wanted to have Norzai returned and different individuals were discussed in terms of being swapped, different things like that. And obviously, it was something that the Justice Department had to weigh in because it, this was a major prosecution that they had obviously spent a lot of money on. And so ultimately, there was a demand to swap Haji Bashir Norzai for an American that had been kidnapped in Afghanistan in 2020. Mark Frerich, he was a Navy veteran and been working in Afghanistan as a civil engineer and had been held captive for two years up until that point. And so in 2022, the president commuted Bashir Norzai's sentence after, I believe, about 16, 17 years. There was a, an exchange given. He was returned to Afghanistan and the Taliban returned Mark Frerich to the United States. What was the feeling on the squad when Norzai decided not to cooperate because this was a terrorism squad. You were hoping to gain information about the Taliban and what's going on in Afghanistan and terrorism and hoping, like we do in many of our investigations, that you start with this type of violation, a drug case, and that maybe it will move into more information. So what, was there a disappointment? Were you satisfied? with the charges and the conviction. I'd love to hear both of your opinion about that. Yeah, I'll start. I think there was disappointment, I think, on our side. I don't think we were surprised that he chose not to cooperate again. That kind of goes into understanding the culture that he comes from and the position that he had, that he didn't see any value in cooperating once he was arrested. He felt betrayed. And so there wasn't really anything to leverage to build rapport back. So we were disappointed. And I think we in the FBI had thought there was some possibilities of him providing intelligence again of value in the war on terrorism and the situation in Afghanistan. He had done that in the past with other agencies. There was a possibility of doing that again. The challenge was he couldn't do that from the United States. This wasn't a situation where we could keep him in the United States and maybe have him make phone calls, maybe like you would do in a typical criminal investigation, right? Do phone calls and record them and things. To get information, he had to go back over into Afghanistan, into the border areas, and then he would have to task people within his family and his tribe, right, to go get information. So that would have been challenging. It would have required not only the FBI, but other parts of the intelligence agency. I think some of us on the FBI side thought it was worth it, but because the kingpin status, because he was the first one, we as the U.S. government kind of named him the Pablo Escobar of Afghanistan, right? So it was this government idea from the U.S. side that we're looking at every aspect to kind of fight this war in Afghanistan, not just terrorism, drugs, and things like that, you know, whole of government. So we were kind of running against that. We didn't have much success in that argument. That was very politically correct. <laughs> All right. So Chris, what is your thoughts? Craig, that's, he is <laughs> the ambassador. We'll just call Craig the ambassador. He's being kind because I know he remembers the two of us a little heated, to say the least. I think that 11 days, it seems on paper like that is a long time to talk to somebody. But as Craig has so eloquently pointed out the importance of this subject, this target, he had so much more to offer. The kingpin status that Craig described very well as well worked against us. It was a situation where I think people who had been working intelligence counterterrorism cases for quite some time all realized that the value was just starting to be tapped. And regardless of where we could place him, his historical knowledge was vast. And to really get what the mission of the FBI and the mission of the United States government was at the time, we needed more time. This, once again, was a very in-depth, tedious process to get the designation of the kingpin, to lure him to the United States, and to be the very large notch in the belt of a lot of people who had worked very hard to get to that point. And to their credit, they did a very good job of that. To Craig's credit, he was doing a phenomenal job interviewing Norzai, and I got the luxury of sitting in a different room listening to it real time. That was inspiring. It was validating for all of the years and all of the agents that had been working these violations. This was one of those cases and one of those subjects in these cases that was why you do this job, because you see the return on investment immediately and you start to wish and hope that it continues as long as you can. So when it comes to an end in an abrupt manner in the way this did, then there is a substantial level of disappointment. 
despite the pleadings to FBI management, it was made very clear that that kingpin status was what was driving the train. And ultimately, what the decision was, was to cease the conversation. And as much as we hoped that post-arrest he would cooperate, we knew leading up to that point, that was probably a pipe dream at that juncture. And sure enough, he proved us right. I guess for him, it really worked out because there would not have been a request for an exchange if he had cooperated. My second question is, what do you think about the fact that his sentence was commuted and he was exchanged and allowed to return to Afghanistan? Anything we can do to get people like Mark Farrick's back we should engage in, in any capacity whatsoever. I know I had a similar situation with the Bo Bergdahl scenario. Several of the individuals that I interviewed in Guantanamo were exchanged for Mr. Bergdahl. So I'd been through this before, and I can say that there is a battle, an internal battle with myself, trying to figure out the greater good of this situation. When we can bring an American back, that's ultimately the deciding force here. Regardless of the situation, we should try to do that. And I think that was a very big benefit for Mark Frerich, his family, and the U.S. as a whole. We stood by our values as a country, which is really where our soul lies, and did the right thing. Norzai is a spiritual leader of a group that is proven time and time again to be a brutal force. And regardless of where he lands or how he's landed in that organization, that's not going to change our mission. But if we would allow for Frerichs to be held, then that changes who we are as a country. That's the ultimate debate I've had internally with myself to come to the conclusion that I think it was the right thing to do. Yeah, I'd say we had the same kind of internal discussion. I think with Frerich, I would agree. Anytime we can get a U.S. citizen back, it's important to do that. I was involved in a kidnapping investigation while I was an ALAD in Germany for several years, and we were able to return a German-American from Somalia. And it's very rewarding. And the politics had changed. So once the U.S. government made the decision to withdraw from Afghanistan, we had no U.S. presence, military presence there after 2021. So there is a valid argument that the war has kind of been concluded. There is a sense that if a war is concluded, you kind of return your prisoners of war back of the candidates, I think Chris and I would agree that this was this was the right thing to do. I think it was a little bit more troubling when there was talks of Bo Bergdahl, given the circumstances around his kidnapping and things like that. With Mark Frerich, it was understandable at that time that that was the course that the U.S. government chose. Yeah, had we were still been kind of engaged in Afghanistan and still there and in a presence and still dealing with Al Qaeda and things like that, that might have been different. But the politics and the situation on the ground changed. To conclude this and go full circle, what is the status of Abdul as Rabzada? Because of his extensive cooperation in the investigation, identifying Mohammedin Azizi, who is the ultimate target of our domestic investigation and his network, as Rabzada was given 60 months of prison time, which he was furious about, but he was looking at a mandatory life sentence based upon his previous criminal history and the amount of heroin that we seized from him. It was a very good deal from him. He, My understanding is he went back home, and I don't know if he's still running a chicken store or not, but he had a teenage son, I believe, at the time. So, of course, that was long enough ago to where his kids are adults, and he's probably living his life somewhere in New York or you know, wherever he ended up, but I didn't really follow it. Fascinating case review. So many layers to it, different situations and scenarios and violations. I think this would make a great book. Chris, why don't you tell us a little bit about your future plans when it comes to this true crime story? Navigating the process of the FBI internally with any kind of book writing I've heard is a bit of a nightmare. But that being said, I decided to go ahead and pursue this. I love to tell stories, as you probably can figure out thus far from our discussion today. And so I thought, why not turn this into a bit of a fiction series? The vast majority of this case is kind of the foundation for a first attempt at a novel. A little spin here and there to fictionalize it considerably. Did a lot of character development and worked very closely with a relative of mine, my mother, who is very accomplished in her own right. She and I have, my post-FBI career, have had conversations about building these characters and developing a story, using a little bit of sprinkling of facts 
to create fiction. So it's been a fun process. And so I've spent a little bit of time doing that while trying to figure out what the process is in order to get published, which, Jerry, you've been able to navigate quite a bit. Congratulations to that. So hopefully to follow in your footsteps a little bit to put something out there for the enjoyment of others and see where it ends up. There's a lot of series of books out there that have done very well with, I think, a lot less drama that this case possesses in and of itself and a number of other cases. All right. Well, don't forget, once your book is published, to let me know so that I can share it with everyone here, because I think they would be fascinated. And of course, I would add it to my FBI reading resource, which is a list of over 80 books now of agents writing about the FBI. And those agents, of course, have all been guests on this show. So I would love to be able to add you to those ranks. Well, the feeling is very mutual. Now we are at the part of the interview where we get to learn a little bit more about you. Who wants to start with my standard question of when and why you joined the FBI? Well, I'd love to hear Craig's. I joined the FBI in 1998. Out of college, I was commissioned in the Army as a military intelligence officer. So I had spent five years in that capacity and had worked with the NSA started to begin to kind of work with some of the other intelligence agencies and recognize that the FBI was an opportunity to kind of be in the intelligence community, but do investigations. I was very interested in doing national security work, counterterrorism and counterintelligence. So I transitioned from the Army and joined the FBI and started Quantico in September of 1998 went up to New York and spent about 13, 14 years there, and then had an opportunity to go overseas as an ALAT in Berlin, Germany, and then returned to the States and was a counterintelligence supervisor in the Newark office for the last five years of my career. And Chris? I started off, I was a student at Bradley University in Peoria, Illinois, and I was interviewing for a couple of different positions in between my sophomore and junior year and the U.S. probation office was hiring student contractors. So I got into law enforcement by being awarded that position and spent a year there before I graduated and then went to Peoria County to work as an adult probation officer. So I was there for about four years during a hiring freeze with the FBI. One of the FBI agents that uh, worked across the hall for me while I was a student contractor came over and said, hey, you need to apply. And I said, to what? <laughs> he said, uh, you know, you make a good agent. And I said, well, I'll take your word for it and filled out the employment form, submitted it. And 18 months later, I ended up at Quantico, two weeks, I think, ahead of Craig, if I'm not mistaken, because I started in September as well. Both ended up in the New York office about the same time. I remember my first day at Quantico, and this is a story I like to tell people from time to time, is that we're all doing our introductions on day one, and there is the cadre of FBI instructors standing in front of the whiteboard listening to who this new batch of recruits is, and they started in the back, and I'm the second person from the front with my last name of Anglin, and every single person stood up and said, it's been my lifelong dream to be an FBI agent. I'm thinking to myself, oh boy. Because that's not exactly how I approached it. I'm thrilled to be there, very excited about the opportunity, but I was thinking to myself as they were going through this, boy, I'm glad you guys got in because I wouldn't know what you would do if you didn't. <laughs> so, they get to me and I, uh, of course, have to be my normal self and said, well, you know, I was done trying to rehabilitate people as a probation officer, so I thought I'd just start arresting him. I could see the changes in the faces of the instructors immediately identifying who the problem child in Quantico was going to be for that session. And sure enough, I lived up to my reputation, I think, a couple of times. But it was a fun process. My first child was 18 months when I left, so it was a difficult 16 weeks based upon separation. But I made it through by the hair of my chin, which is the last hair I have anymore. And I enjoyed the 25 years, close to 25 years that I spent there and would not change a thing, including having New York number 46 on my list. I would have put it back to number one because those experiences are just, there's nothing to compare to it. And of course, I never would have met Craig. Now we're both at Verizon of all places and working separate issues from a very large corporation, seeing how those values return to it. But it's been a great, great run seeing where the next process takes us. I did read your bio at the beginning. I always do that. A short run of each of your bios when this episode goes out at the very beginning. But I know for you that you really had a varied career somewhat like I did of being program manager 
But I wanted to talk just a little bit. We've already talked about the National Academy, which you were a part of, but we haven't really talked a lot on FBI Retired Case File Review about InfraGuard and all those programs. And you were the coordinator of the Office of Private Sector. What the hell is that? (laughs) That was a very interesting time. The strategic partnership program was in place before the Office of Private Sector really was what it was organized into. So I remember about 2015 when this reorganization occurred. And of course, in the FBI, if you're not reorganizing something, you're not doing your job. My SAC at the time, Sean Cox, came to me and said, hey, listen, we need a private sector coordinator. I said exactly the same thing you did, Jerry. What is that? I had just raised my hand to go work counterintelligence. A lot of economic espionage with the division that I was in, and so a lot of outreach to corporations. And he said, that's exactly what I want you to be doing. I want you to lead the charge in developing relationships between the C-suites of major corporations, some medium and small organizations as well, within our division to try to build a team to combat foreign adversarial threats, and mostly cyber-related. So I was happy to do that. It was something that had not been directly in my wheelhouse. So I love learning new opportunities that come along and made the most of it as I could and did that for the last four years and really did some great work working closely with CSOs and CISOs, making sure that they had all the tools that the FBI had to offer in their toolbox to combat these threats. That was really what set me up, I think, for what I'm doing now post-FBI retirement, but also allowed me a third leg of the stool for developing a national security course for our police chiefs and police executives that come through the national security. So when I was able to go back to Quantico after I hit my 20-year anniversary, I was tasked with developing this national security course that I think was very impactful. And a big component of that was employing those first line responders and those soldiers in our community really to be able to converse with the companies that are underneath their umbrella and underneath their guidance as well. So they were able to go back, talk to talk, develop some of those relationships that were very important to make sure that those companies remained healthy and productive for the community as a whole. I really take a lot of pride in that process and really expanded my network and has developed relationships across the globe because of the international component as well to the National Academy. It's just been a fantastic career that was capped with that experience that I just could never replace. And Craig, when did you retire? I retired in the summer of 2021. I was working in the Newark office then as a supervisor, and I moved over to Verizon in New Jersey. Their corporate headquarters are here in New Jersey. So I'm in their global security department, taking a lot of the skills that I learned from the FBI in terms of intelligence and analysis and providing insights, doing a lot of geopolitical strategic reporting, kind of new market assessments of different areas in the world, focus globally, and then a little bit more towards Latin America now for our company when we're looking at expanding relationships and businesses and suppliers and things like that. A lot of the skills that I learned in the FBI in terms of writing and assessing and analyzing, making judgments and things like that have served me well in the new role here at Verizon. At the end of each interview, I like to give my guest the last word. I'm going to have Craig go first. Give us some words of wisdom, anything that you want to say about this case, about the FBI, whatever, I'm going to give you that opportunity to say it, and then we'll follow up with words of wisdom from Chris. Thanks, Jerry. I guess, yeah, I look back at this case and I say one of the things to be most proud of was the fact that we were able to pull a lot of valuable intelligence out of what would be deemed in the FBI a kind of a criminal investigation. That was something that the 9-11 Commission was critical of the FBI of. I don't think that was really ever the case. I don't think that was a valid criticism, but I think this case in particular, we kind of proved the fact that the FBI can continue to do both, can continue to do criminal investigations and continue to develop intelligence and be part of the intelligence community. I think both aspects of that were reflective of this case. I think that's the thing that I look back on and say that was what was most valuable to be part of. Chris? I think Craig provided a great segue there to talking about some of the criticisms. I'll take it a little bit more into a larger picture and the criticisms of the FBI. I can tell you from my experience in the FBI, especially the last several years being at Quantico, that the FBI is in very good hands moving forward. I know at a time right now when it's under attack 
in a situation that's unprecedented internally, externally, from former FBI employees, from elected officials to a good portion of our country. We have an amazing amount of talented recruits that are becoming agents and analysts every day after graduation of each class. They are extremely well equipped. They are better trained than Craig and I were because of the advancements in training techniques. They are really presenting a pathway to a very bright future and contributing to the safety of this country every single day. And I really implore, especially former agents, to support everything that they continue to do on a day-to-day basis. I think that the FBI has an extremely bright future because of the people that are in it, just like the successes that Craig and I enjoyed while we were there, and Jerry, yourself as well. This is an organization that is unmatched. The people within it are phenomenal. The reason I had a problem retiring from the FBI when I did was because I still had some runway left. And I was, frankly, scared to see what I was going to land into and the quality of the people that I would be working with. And I'm pleasantly surprised by what I found, but there is just nothing that matches the folks that I had the pleasure of working with for over two decades and continue to keep in touch with and call my friends and family. So keep up the good fight because these folks are worthy of that. And that's the end of the interview. In your podcast app's description of this episode, there's a link to the show notes at jerrywilliams.com where you'll find a photo of Chris Anglin and Craig McLaughlin, case-related images and links to articles about Operation Crown Prince and the exchange for hostage Mark Farrick from the Taliban. There are also links to FBI Retired Case File Review episode 301, where retired agent Zorka Martinovich reviews how the FBI and the State Department negotiate with terrorists for the return of hostages. I hope you enjoyed the interview and that you'll share it with your friends, family, and associates. You can show me just how much you liked it by buying me a coffee. There's a link in your podcast app's description of this episode, or you can visit jerrywilliams.com and tap on the little coffee cup icon in the bottom right-hand corner of my website. Don't forget to follow FBI Retired Case File Review on your favorite podcast app. Now, this podcast is all about true crime, but if you're also interested in crime fiction, once a month via my reader team email, I keep you up to date on the FBI and books, TV, and movies. When you join my reader team, you get access to my FBI reading resource, a colorful list of more than 70 books about the FBI written by FBI agents who have been guests on this podcast. There's nonfiction, crime fiction, true crime, and memoirs. You'll also get my FBI reality checklist where I debunk 20 cliches about the FBI and receive news about what I'm up to and about my FBI nonfiction and crime fiction books. I want to thank you for listening to the very end. I hope you come back for another episode of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. Thank you.